Hello and welcome to the Functional Forum. We are here in Austin, Texas for the Community Reinvention of Medicine and the community has responded to our first live event in almost two years. It's gonna be such an awesome event. We've got over 120 doctors signed up. Passionate community here for the reinvention of medicine. Let's check it out. That bottom tier that James showed of this hierarchy of care and the, the top of it being sometimes I think the things that we go to most or we rely on most as an industry which are pharmaceuticals or nutraceuticals and that bottom foundation being the group programs that we talked about, I believe those are the most important things and that is what I believe we really need to focus on as an industry is bringing people together, um, educating them, making care more accessible to groups around the entire country and the world. So that's the nugget is to take that and run with it as a community. We both loved this functional forum. It was actually my first time ever going to something like this. So oh, yeah. I, I learned a lot. Um, I specifically love the mastery and the mystery. I just loved how she brought those two concepts together and really all of the speakers were amazing. Yeah, and Aiden is central here in mm -hmm. Austin and I actually came up from the greater San Antonio area to be a part of this um, functional forum where mm -hmm. you have a bunch of providers that are bringing their dynamic um, insight and their background and I just thought it's a great way for you to just gain that inspiration um, especially given these mm -hmm. times that we're living in you know to motivate you to 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 find what works for for today what's happening today and so I thought mm -hmm. it was awesome um, it was very inspiring, and I and I especially loved everyone's unique story, mm -hmm. um, the authenticity and the vulnerability that really kind of pulls you in and makes you feel like you're a part of something great. And I think the community aspect of everything is something that we all need. Mm -hmm. Tonight's show is called The Community Reinvention of Medicine. I think there's a lot of people that think they're going to reinvent medicine. I think technology thinks they're going to reinvent medicine, but I used the Barton Springs online booking today, and I'm not so sure. Um, didn't work very well at all. So I'm, uh, I'm excited to see what the power of community can do to really transform medicine. We're going to be talking about in so many ways. We're going to be talking about group delivered care. We're going to be talking about bringing practitioner communities together. And so I'm super, super grateful that you're here. And grateful that you would come out. You know, as I said, it's kind of been um, a little bit of a weird year. But um, I wanted to start by just saying the ideas of what I'm going to be sharing tonight um, come from the book, The Community Cure. Um, this book is about putting groups of people in rooms together and having them reverse their chronic illnesses together. And it came out two months before COVID came here, two months maybe after COVID emerged. Who knows where that came from? Isn't it exciting? <laughs> um, but if you're watching this at home, you can actually get the free audiobook, thecommunitycure.com slash audiobook. You guys can get it too. If you want to listen to it via the smooth sounds of James Maskell, uh, you're more than welcome. And you can listen to it in your car, wherever you want. So it's based on this. But for the last seven, eight years of the Functional Forum, we've been talking about what would it take to really transform healthcare? What would it make, what would it mean to take functional medicine to the masses in a way that we could actually flatten the curve of healthcare costs, right? We're all good at understanding flattening curves now, right? We all understand what it's about. And what I want to share with you today is that, you know, what I thought right from the beginning of the Functional Forum was that if we could just get enough people in front of functional medicine doctors and having them deliver care in an efficient enough way, we could actually get enough of the patient population in the country well so that they weren't reliant on the medical system. And I didn't think really that that was, it was slow going, right? Slow evolution. But the good news is, I think we just had the weirdest year ever, and I think a lot of people have lost trust in the way that we were doing things before. So, you know, you can just think in your mind or you can show with your hands or otherwise, but I think there must be one of these things that I'm about to mention where you felt like maybe we weren't doing it exactly right. So, we've had quite a lot of fear, 
right, in the last year, since we did the last Functional Forum Live at Bastyr University, February 2020, we've had a ridiculous amount of fear coming from every, you know, um, news orifice that, uh, that we have. So fear has been, been everywhere. The wet market transfer, right? Likely, not likely, who knows? Only the most important topic in the world, right? There was that. Vitamin D, we didn't hear about that for very long. And then suddenly people were getting censored for talking about it in this community. I did a podcast with a doctor who was the regional director of COVID response in Oklahoma, responsible for seven hospitals. And he started sharing that like, hey, vitamin D might be important and nutrition might be important and inflammation might be important. And he was kicked off Facebook. And I'm sure all of you guys have a million stories of stuff like that, right? It got weird really quickly. And I think many people are starting to realize like, can I trust the institution of medicine in America, right? Is there something more solid that I could base it on? And I think this is a moment for us, right? Um, PCR testing, the levels, like how that works, you know, how those things are set. Like I think uh, that masking kids, that was a big one for, for a lot of people, was for me. Lockdowns, never used historically before, you know, for this kind of issue. Not really clear, like is it clear how well it worked? Um, the flip-flopping of policy back from one thing to another. It's good one day, whether or not people were getting infections at protests last year and, and what that was like, the politicization of healthcare, right? All of it, you know, it's, it's a weird time to be in healthcare. And I wanna give this example. So early, early, early on, you know, I'm in, I'm in a lot of groups of functional medicine doctors, right, online. And there was a whole group of functional medicine doctors from San Francisco that they added me into the chat. And literally like March 17, these guys are starting threads about what is gonna be the right protocol for COVID and hydrochloroquine comes up again and again. This is, these are liberal doctors from San Francisco, two months later now facing the fact that you know, their, their choices that they were making before it became political were now political. And I think that everyone has had to face that, you know, th things haven't really, you know, made sense. Ivermectin, another one. I know uh, Tom Schnorr has got it on his website and you can, you can get some because ultimately, um, you know, we're just starting to see the, the power of that. Sweden, right, that was confusing for a lot of people too. No masks you know, just living normally. I remember seeing videos last summer of people walking through the subway and people are okay. Sweden is now one of the lowest death rate in the whole of Europe. Never masked, never had any sort of uh, intervention like that. Again, it's confusing for people. The Seychelles right now, like the most vaccinated country in the world, the highest numbers and, you know, having a, a boom of COVID. So there's a lot of things that don't make sense. People are super confused. What can we bet on that's solid and safe? what we're doing in all of our practices, right? I remember Dr. Cheng Ron telling me at the beginning that he had had to change his, like his conventional colleagues had had to change their protocol for COVID five times, but the integrative and functional protocol was the same all the way through. It's because it's built on creating a resilient health in the body. That is solid. That is something that is not confusing. And that is something that the people are reaching for. They want that. And that's what we can deliver. This is our moment. So today, we're gonna to talk about that. Operation Warp Speed, you know, just seeing like, when it was Trump's vaccine, some people were pro, some people were offer. Two weeks later, it was Biden's vaccines and people were different. It's the same companies making them. Nothing's changed. Like, come on. Um, Deplatforming, I know we've seen, uh, seen a lot of that too. And, uh, and now there's so a lot of things to be confused about. So. What better, this has been on the bottom of my email for the last eight years, this Bucky Fuller quote. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. I believe that functional medicine can be that new model, but I don't believe that functional medicine is being delivered in an efficient enough way to make it to poor people. And we're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about how we're going to get it to everyone. And we're going to talk about everyone can play a part. All right. So as I said, it's built on the book. But I want to just go to the final chapter of the book. So spoiler alert for all of you guys who got your book tonight. But we're going to go to the conclusion. Because in the conclusion, I shared what I believe the future of healthcare can be built on. And before I say what it is, I want you to know that I've learned a lot over the last eight years. 
And for something to be really transformative, one, everyone here has to be able to participate, right? Everyone has to be able to participate in this transformation. There's a bit of a choose your own adventure because I know some doctors want to be employees, some doctors want to be entrepreneurs. I'm not sure if relying on entrepreneurship is a good master plan for the bigger picture of healthcare transformation. I think we need um, you know, technology and institutions to play a role too. But I want to share with you the idea that I heard along in these last eight years, the principle that I think that we can base the future of healthcare on where everyone here can participate and see how to participate together. It's called the naturopathic therapeutic order. And if you heard me speak before, and if you read the book, you'll know about it. And what it posits is that we should start with the least costly, least invasive interventions first and work our way up. So let's just see here at the bottom. Establish the foundation for optimal health. Identify and remove obstacles to cure and assess the determinants of health. You will hear a lot about the social determinants of health over the next few years. If you have no car, three kids, and four jobs, you're not starting a new yoga routine, and we need to be in reality about that. And you're not shopping at Whole Foods, right? We need to find ways to solve the social determinants of health. We need to then, once that's taken care of, stimulate the self-healing mechanisms. Sleeping, right, is a self-healing mechanism, but acupuncture and mindfulness-based stress reduction, all the things that turn on the healing capacity of the body. Support and restore weakened systems, that's next, right? That's nutrition, that's dietetics, that's functional nutrition, that happens there. Physical alignment, the, the, the chiropractors, the acupuncturists, the physical therapists, the physical medicine doctors can be in that role. Natural symptom control, then and only then do we get to drugs, synthetic symptom relief, and high force interventions. And I kind of made it simpler in the book, and I tame it this way. So we have empowerment groups, modality groups, and nutrition groups, and these can be the same group. You can empower people in groups, you can get them to do things they've never done with nutrition, and you can get them doing mindfulness-based stress reduction, tapping, acupuncture in those groups. There's plenty of space for the integrated providers, and then functional medicine uh, can be delivered at that point. That's the one-on-one -on -one functional medicine. And then pharmaceuticals and surgery. Now, one thing you will notice about this, the bottom of the pyramid is a lot wider than the top because we need a lot more of this down here. And what I'm going to share with you today is what we're doing to rapidly grow this part. Because I think we might already have enough of these, right? In, in Austin, we already do. There's a ton, and they're doing amazing work. But ultimately, the only way that we can get everyone healthy is if everyone else is playing their role too. So I'm super excited to kick off tonight um, with a doctor that is on the front lines of functional medicine, has been building practice and practitioner community. Um, really excited for her talk tonight. Please welcome to the stage the local doctor, Dr. Julie Reardon. Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun. I say it's all right. Little darlings, it's been a long, long, lonely winter <laughs> and a long year. And what a sacred time this pandemic has been. Am I off with my microphone? Eric? It's just not you, it's this. Uh, this pandemic has been a teacher for us. Have you learned something this year? Have we learned something about what's important to us? Have we learned things and seen what's important to our patients? learned how technology can drive us crazy doing telemedicine all the time and staring at a screen all the time, managing with our children. There's a lot of stuff. So I wanted to, when James asked me what to talk tonight, I decided what did I want to talk to this like brilliant group of people about? You guys have like such gifts. And I thought I'd use this kind of time where we're coming back and like hugging each other and seeing each other's faces a time to remember to be authentic, a time to remember to be real. And how does functional medicine help us be authentic and real? And so I went back and reflected on one of my um, teachers a long time ago, Rachel Naomi Remen, who teaches about the healer's art. And she talks about the importance of mystery and mastery. And we have such mastery in functional medicine, and I think you're gonna hear some amazing things as we go through the, the evening, and it has to also do with the, the pyramids that James is talking about. 
And with mastery we need. We need to know all of our biochemistry. We need to know our genomics. We're having a lot of, t a lot of knowledge. And you guys have all studied and have so much knowledge in this room. But to be real, to be authentic, we need to hold on to the mystery. We also need to know we don't know it all, but we can hold the mystery and the mastery and hold that space. So I wanted to just share a story about this patient I've had that has chronic fatigue and every list of all the problems. And we've done all of her genomics, and we've done a whole, um, we've done a lot of tests to look at her chronic EBV and how her immune system is dysregulated. And this pandemic has caused such chaos in her. And she says, you know, I practiced this year being afraid. I've been afraid all year. And so her autonomic nervous system is way out. And when I talked to a, um, her therapist, it dawned on me that part of what my goal for her, or my, what I need for to her right now, is she needs to not work with me. <laughs> because there's a dynamic she has with me being up on that pyramid that James is talking about, is me being the doctor, and she wants to please the doctor, and so she's gonna do all the things and take all the things, and that's perpetuating some of the things that's happening within her autonomic nervous system. So as we leave here tonight and we kind of enter hopefully this new phase where we're gonna be able to continue to meet like this and hug each other and smile at each other and be real, I want us to remember to be real and hold on to not only the mastery of what we have within functional medicine, but leave some space for the mystery. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Beautifully said. I wanna, I want to echo something that, that um, Julie said there that's really important. So we've been helping doctors do group visits here for the last two years. And in these group visits now that we've been doing, we're hearing a phrase that might shock and horrify you. And that phrase is, I could never talk to that about, about that to my doctor. And it's just exactly what you said. And just think, you're all doing the best work that you can with the information that you have, but what if you have the wrong information because of just those kind of dynamics? And that's why uh, we're gonna be talking a lot more about groups. So on that uh, theme, I wanted to give a shout out to the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center. Um, as I mentioned, you know, these guys have been at the front of the line in really creating resources to educate patients consistently. They've got a new GI uh, health program with online onboarding. If you haven't checked it out, make sure to go and see what they've got going on. Um, these in-practice in guides are super valuable. I don't know if anyone has time to make these all themselves. And so your time is valuable um, to be able to use these kind of resources that have been creating. They've got ones for dysbiosis, GERD, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and SIBO. And there's a ton of good information there. If you want to connect, you can go to lifestylematrix.com. Um, they'll chat with you there and uh, get you going. All right. Next, so we, we, we want to practice authentic medicine, but we need to work out how we can model the delivery of functional medicine to make it to, to realign incentives, because incentives are a big mess in functional medicine, in medicine generally, and also somewhat in functional medicine. So please welcome to the stage, Dr. Philip Oob. <laughs> Okay, so first I want to point out that we were strictly told that there are no slides, James. <laughs> Double standard, not fair, okay? <laughs> so I don't want to say I've got the right model or the right membership or whatever, but I have uh, created something that we feel is very special, and it came from a dark place because, let me set the stage, it was very ominous. It was December 2016. I had to open my practice in January 2016. No idea what I was doing, but I knew I wanted to do functional medicine. I did a cash pace, despite my parents' best advice that I should go insurance-based. But I wanted to do cash because I felt like that's the way to spend more time with your patients. Well, in December, nobody wants to pay you to see you because they're eating cookies, they're eating candy canes, they're eating all the things they're not supposed to. And so the fee-for-service model came to a screeching halt. And I was working in the ER at the time, funding my practice and doing the practice on the side. And um, so in my back and forth travels to the ER, I listened to the soothing sounds of James Maskell reading The Evolution of Medicine to me. Oh, luckily, I didn't fall asleep. But um, 
Very good advice in the book. And um, one of the things James talked about that I had never heard about was the membership model. And as physicians, practitioners alike, nobody does the membership model. That's a gym thing. That's a magazine thing. That's a CD thing if you're old enough, right? And um, so when, when I read, heard about the membership model, I thought it was absolutely crazy. Someone's going to pull me off the stage at five minutes, right? And, um, and so in 2016, December, I am crying because I'm having to work in the ER to literally pay my bills in the practice and work 40 hours a week at the practice. And a buddy of mine, Ching Ron, is also an encouragement to me that says, you need to do the membership model. So as everyone knows about me, I go to the spreadsheet, map it all out, put everything on the spreadsheet. How much is it going to cost me? How many do I need to sign up? What are all the patients I think are going to sign up? How's this going to work? And surprisingly, above all else, and DPC docs alike will understand that the membership model is incredibly affordable, so much more than anyone would ever imagine. And so December 12th, 2016, I hit the email send button on a campaign that said, sign up for my membership, please, because I'm going bankrupt and I don't want to have to invest any more money. And surprisingly, it was a huge success. I went from, in December 2016, to be completely broke, maybe not be able to pay my rent unless I work more in the ER, to the biggest month of my entire, pre well, not entire practice, but entire uh, at that point in time, the biggest month of my practice, and then January led to an even bigger month. And it has been the most wonderful thing out there. And I could talk for, if everyone knows, I could talk for hours on why the membership model is beneficial. And I know we've got a lot of brilliant minds out here, and I wish I had something to say about fancy functional medicine or something. But doing the membership model has been wonderful for my patients and myself alike. So I want to leave you with three things, if I can remember those three things. And one is that there's so much crazy stuff in medicine about, is about how much it's going to cost and what about this, what about that, I don't know, and functional medicine is so crazy, some people are really expensive. The most wonderful thing about the membership model is I know how much my visits cost and I can budget for that. I know if I can pay $200 a month. I know if I can pay $350 a month. So the number one thing for the patient is that it is cost clarity. They know what their visits are going to cost. There's no surprises. And if there's someone that needs more help, then they get the same cost, but they get more help. And so someone else may need less help, but the membership kind of evens the playing ground. Okay. Number two is actually access to your provider. It seems totally backwards, but when someone has unlimited access to you, they actually use less of your time. It is a weird psychological benefit of the membership model. And then third and most important, because I was going bankrupt in December of 2016, is it is dependable income that you know is going to come in month after month. So it's a benefit for the practice, it's a benefit for the patient, and it's a benefit to functional medicine all in all. Win, win, win. And I don't know what my time was. Did I do okay? All right. Thank you, Dr. Hood. You know, I wanted to have one session on models, mainly because this is what we've been doing the last 10 years. So this is what the evolution of medicine has been, really, for the last 10 years, is helping doctors make the switch to have models that are more dependable. If you have a chance, we're, we're right in the middle of this new models podcast series that we started two months ago. If you've never listened to the podcast, go back and listen to Dr. David Tusek talk about his shift to a membership model. It's really, you know, the, the solving the, the, what he calls um, the 10 pitfalls of practice, like areas where medicine has completely lost its way, um, and you've done that. And that's really what we'll be doing at the Practice Accelerator too. This is the evolution of medicine. The last 10 years has really been helping doctors, you know, move into these kind of practices. I took a lot of calls. Uh, in March and April of last year, and some doctors who had not done, um, who had not shifted to telemedicine, they weren't that happy, they had to get that hustle on, and some doctors that wished they'd shifted to a membership model, but the unicorn doctors that had a telemedicine component and a membership model were super happy about what was going on because the money was coming in every month and they could support their patients whatever happened uh, out in the world. So it was really, really special. All right, so we are now gonna be talking about, you know, we've gone through, these guys are, are generalists, right, are seeing all kinds of things in their practice. One of the awesome things about what I'm seeing in Austin is just how many specialties functional medicine is making its way into. And part of my passion where this came from is when I was just starting my career and I was a sales rep selling to practitioners, um, I got really involved in the autism community because I saw that there were some incredible results that were possible. And so um, when I heard about Dr. Emily Gutierrez and the work that she was doing, I wanted to have her here. She's on vacation, but she made us a video. So here's Dr. Emily Gutierrez. 
I've been providing pediatric medical care for over 15 years, and half of it has been with functional medicine. So I've been on both sides, if you will. We started Neuronutrition Associates in 2015, and at that time, we were one of the fewest pediatric functional medicine practices to ever exist. And while our patient community embraced us with open arms, there were some provider skeptics in our community. Who are those ladies over there, and what are they doing, and what is IFMCP, or functional medicine, anyway? So you can imagine when I first received my first official referral from Dell Children's Hospital, our largest children's hospital here in Austin for a functional medicine evaluation, I literally wept. And then I hung it on my wall for several years, and every time I passed it, I felt a sense of validation. But why did I need it? I'm a Hopkins grad, after all, I know evidence-based medicine. I know there's research to support my patient management with curcuminoids for autoimmune inflammation, high-dose omegas in neuroinflammatory syndromes, and elimination of IgG-sensitized food with the toddler with atopic dermatitis. Yet it still can feel like at times, us and them. If one of us is right, then the other one of us is wrong. If Celebrex is the answer for juvenile arthritis, then restoring the microbiome is not. So why do people choose sides? It's not one paradigm of care or the other, it's both. My vision for the reinvention of pediatric chronic care and medicine is collaboration. When the parents are surrounded by providers that collaborate and support each other's care, it can be transformative for that family. It can change their health care outcome. One paradigm of care does not exclude the other. In children, they need a village. They need their family, therapists, teachers, pediatricians, specialty care providers, and functional care. So why are some providers still stuck in dismissing functional medicine and its legitimacy? I believe one of the driving factors is lack of education in colleges. While the IFM was one of the most transformative tracks of education I have ever been through in my life, and they remain the gold standard of care and education, why do we have to wait? The education paradigm is us and them. We have to bring functional medicine to colleges. Providers should be introduced to functional medicine during their education, not after it. I teach at Johns Hopkins and the University of Texas at Austin, but it's only for a few lectures on functional medicine a year. And those of you that know functional medicine know that that is absolutely not a lot of time. I'm also a guest speaker, adjunct faculty, not a part of the curriculum. Functional medicine needs to be part of the core curriculum. Having functional medicine a part of college curriculum can get us governing boards of medicine accepting functional medicine and insurance providers covering it. A family that encounters an allopathic provider that has at least heard of functional medicine during their college education would hopefully be so much more open to a collaborative care effort in patient management. Our goals in healthcare are the same reduce the disease burden and foster wellness and resilience in our children. So my vision for the reinvention of pediatric chronic care and medicine is collaboration and provider education. Thank you for listening. All right, do we agree with that? I think we do. So, you know, the goal of the Functional Forum has always been to make it easy for conventional doctors to show up and rub shoulders with those doctors who are already doing it, to listen to lectures from people who are just like them so that they can really understand, you know, what's happening in these kind of practices because there's so many inspiring practitioners out there. And look, when we started the Functional Forum, we had a lot of talent in New York and we would put them all on the stage and then when they had the meetups in... Kansas City, Missouri, there wasn't a lot of functional medicine talent there, but there is now. There's a lot of talent in every city across this country, and so we think it's the perfect time to be building community and collaboration. So I want to give a shout out to our next speaker who has build, been building community here in Austin um, for more than a decade. Um, we are going to get into some of the specialty areas of functional medicine, so please welcome from the Austin Compounding Pharmacy, Tom Schnorr. Wow. 
Wow, thank y'all. God dang, it's good to see y'all. I miss you, every one of you. Wow. Okay, thanks. <laughs> y'all know I talk too damn much, so I put a timer out for me. Um, God. Okay, we got to bring the AFM back. It's been a, a year and a half. COVID ain't going away, but how we deal with it is. Oh, do the microphones speak louder? Okay, well, I usually don't need a microphone, but I'm really at peace, because this girl married me two days ago. <laughs> and that's the best thing that COVID has brought to me, that I've been able to spend a year with her uninterrupted. Oh my God, am I a lucky guy. And I'm not gonna fuck it up. I... <laughs> <sighs> what do we want to talk about? <sighs> 2,100 suicides a, a month in the United States. And we have tools to stop it. And just like COVID, ketamine has got a stigma that needs to go away. My sister killed herself while on Prozac in the early 70s. It is the most terrible drug this side of Premarin. Remarin's gone away because of all y'all's work in functional medicine and using bioidenticals, and thank you. I haven't stocked it in my pharmacy in 15 years, and the one person who's taken was a practitioner. Go figure. But back to ketamine, the drug that will resolve PTSD, stress, anxiety, fear, it right-sizes things amazingly. Now we're all waiting for MDMA and psilocybin to be legal and be used, and the data is so strong. Yes, I mean, soldiers getting 600 MIGs over a two-week period, two doses, and two years later, their shitstorm is right-sized. Ketamine's been out since 1967. It was created by a Swedish doctor who was trying to find a replacement for the PCP he loved to abuse. <laughs> the military picked it up and we used it in Vietnam War instead of lidocaine because the soldiers could inject themselves, suture up the wound, and be able to pick up a gun in 15 minutes. It became a rave drug, and then MDMA came back on and replaced it. Ketamine's back is a rave drug. I thought it was because the music's so bad, but I don't know. <laughs> but meanwhile, <laughs> While we were all seeing the wonderful results of MDMA, and us being smart not to screw it up this time on psychotropics, that we found out we could use ketamine in a controlled environment. And it's working, damn it. At present, I have a little over 900 patients doing the at-home therapy one time to three times a week. Um, it's phenomenal. They start with either IV, IM, and we have a couple practitioners in town that have gone to ketamine-assisted therapy with a lower dose in a group. They get like-minded patients with similar issues to sit together and drop the fear and anxiety and, and start right-sizing. I work with them on using a lot of theanine, oxytocin to help further lower the fear I've got some handouts out back on the back, ta back table to help educate y'all, share them. If y'all want any assistance and talk about it, it's an investment of time to do them right. But the payoff is phenomenal, even more than bioidentical hormones in my book, uh, for me. Now, I have been involved in the community over five years, and I hope to come back and talk about it more. I have one minute. COVID, it's gonna be with us. I have brochures on the back desk of my Corona six pack, I lovingly call it, thanks to Colleen's words. It's a handful of nutritionals, and actually it's seven, but who, who's counting? And on top of it are eight drugs we know will work, and on my website there's 36 pages of, of accepted science to prove each one of the statements on that page. Download it, print it. Circle what you want, send it in. Uh, to me, or peoples, I love peoples. They, it's where I started when I came here 15 years, 20 years ago. You know, Bill Swale was the first person to, in, in pharmacy to realize nutrition is the answer. And bless his heart, and I hold him dear in my soul. 
Thank y'all. James, thanks for hosting this. And y'all look marvelous. Thank you, Tom. Awesome. So grateful for bringing that topic here to the Functional Forum. Uh, the Functional Forum we did in 2017 on medical cannabis is still the number one forum. It's been over, seen over 100,000 times. And so we're super excited to see uh, you know, the evolution of the space. I made one critical error. That was not just these guys getting married and you getting married, but Dr. Oob, I think you got engaged this weekend as well. Congratulations, uh, it's that kind of year. I had a COVID baby, right? So we all, uh, we all, uh, we all did it. All right, so um, I wanna talk to you now about something that is super critical and something that I've been waiting like four years to talk about because it's been four years in the offing. We at the functional medicine community have to model certain things for our patients. We have to model health, right? We have to model health, but we also have to model belonging because a lot of people in the world don't have belonging. And I saw this graph and I just thought that it really spoke to the things that go into belonging, inclusion, right? Feel, people feeling included in the conversation, equity, right? It's people feeling like there's, there's distributed power and then diversity. If we really are going to confront medical power, Right, to go back to what Russell Brand said earlier, to confront medical power collectively and transform the, uh, transform the practice of medicine, truly, we need to create a culture of belonging. And ultimately, at the early functional forums, when the meetup started, and it just like, we went from five meetups in January 2015 to 400 in less than a year. And we had a, we had a team of four people working for us, and we had no idea what we were doing. But right from the beginning, we wanted to make sure that every type of practitioner that participated in this integrative and functional medicine space was welcome. They were included and that we had good diversity of opinions because I know for all of you, if you sit in a circle and you talk about patient cases with the practitioners who aren't trained like you, that's when you learn the most. And equity, the most boring thing in medicine is that like the specialists are better than the generalists and the generalists are better than the naturopaths and the naturopaths are better than the dietitians and all the way down, that's got to go, right? We've got to have a flat culture where people all bring their skills to bear. And so this is the energy of, you know, what we're going to be building. And I'm super excited tonight to announce that we are launching, relaunching the functional forum meetups as functional forum communities. And the reason why these aren't meetups is because it used to just be like we're getting together once a month or we're gonna get together once a quarter and connect. Ultimately, we wanna turn these into real communities. These are the 26 cities that are gonna launch at the end of the summer. So you can see Austin's in there. We're actually pretty strong in Texas. We've got San Antonio, Houston. Phoenix, we got Mexico City, Mexico, we got Ottawa, Ontario, we got London in the UK. I expect this to be 50 by the end of the year and 100 by next year and 1,000 in five years all across the world. I'm super, super excited about it. So what is the difference between a functional forum uh, community and a meetup? Well, first, we're gonna do a lot more than just meet up. Yes, there will be local events. But inside the technology that we're building, there will be practitioner memberships and different ways for practitioners to be involved. There will be a practitioner directory, right? At the moment, it's kind of weird to find functional medicine, right? To go via the education organization's website, ultimately to have one place where the functional medicine practitioner community are listed and you know what their specialty is and whether they take insurance and what their model is. Like we need that for our industry right now. There's gonna be that, there's gonna be obviously local events and then community connections. So things like a job board, right? Things where um, local boards where p practitioners can be discussing in between the events. So this is just a little bit about who should join our community. And I wanna talk about this, gaining trustworthy referrals. I know that many of you have come to realize that you're really good at working with some types of patients and that there are other types of patients that you'd rather not work with, right? There's a lot of diagnoses that can be really complicated to deal with and having to read up on all the different issues of every different chronic illness that you're gonna come across is difficult. So we are modeling this meetup. You know, there, there's some successful meetups that have been running for a long time here in Austin and in St. Louis. And I wanted to just share um, 
This lady is called Kristen Brokaw. Kristen ran the St. Louis Institute for Integrative Medicine for the last 12 years. It's a super consistent meetup where people uh, show up and have dinner at least once a quarter and connect. And ultimately, you know, Kristen and I, a couple of years ago, I, I reached out to her because I really wanted to learn from her experience of running a super successful meetup. And so one of the things that, when I said everyone can participate in the transformation of healthcare, one thing that Kristen and I have in common is that we're both sales reps. That's how we started. There are people in this industry that are passionate about the transformation of functional medicine but aren't practitioners. And these guys, like Kristen and me, you know what we do? We call hundreds of practitioners every week and invite them to meetups. I did it for 10 years. That's how the functional forum started. Kristen did the whole thing. So as you see this transformation, we're gonna be bringing in brands and, and groups of people that have an incentive to bring the community together. So I'm super excited to share that um, some of the initial partners that we have, the Institute for Functional Medicine that I haven't put on here, but Ortho Molecular, Full Script, Freedom Practice Coaching, Genova, Quicksilver Science, Scientific, Chris Shade, he's here in the house, came all the way down. They've been running the meetup in, in Boulder area for uh, the last few years. Clinical education in the UK. I'm having some really exciting conversations with people in Europe and Asia and Australia who want to get into the mix. So um, this has been a, a, a true labor of love and I'm super excited to see what the potential is to really create practitioner communities all over the country and all over the world. So, what happens once we have these communities? What should we do? Well, we should have a little friendly competition, I feel like, could be the best way to get things going. So, coming in 2022, just to get your uh, wick wet, we are gonna have uh, America's Functional Medicine City. And one of the criteria is gonna be how cool is the community? How regularly do they get together? You know, how many different types of practitioners are there? What kinds of different specialties are there? What is the social cohesion like? We'll be measuring it by a number of uh, factors that I have yet to come up with, but it's gonna be great. Um, but yeah, so hope you're excited about this, America's Functional Medicine City and uh, building communities of practitioners. All right. So now we're going to get into some of the uh, some more of the specialties. We're super excited to have one of the leaders in uh, the world of uh, chronic infections, and never has this been a more exciting uh, time than in the era of COVID. So please welcome to the stage, Dr. Anne Shippey. It's so great to be here because. I thought it was tomorrow night, because originally it was planned, so I'm using my notes tonight. <laughs> Who am I? What do I desire? And what is my dharma? Does anybody recognize those questions? I learned those questions when I was studying meditation under Deepak Chopra about 15 years ago, and it dramatically changed meditation for me. All of a sudden, my sense of well-being shifted, and different answers came into my head other than what do I want to have for breakfast? <laughs> so as a former chemical engineer turned functional medicine physician, I love to solve complex problems for people with health problems. And I really believe that to get the right answer, you have to ask the right questions. So whether we're building a bridge and asking, can we do this affordably or can we make it beautiful to get the answer that we're looking for, we've got to be aware of the questions. And in our functional medicine practices, we get to do the same, whether it's something simple like a headache, and we know we've gotten to the right question and the right answers when the problem is solved, it's gone. So last year during COVID, I was really doubting our political leaders as well as our medical leaders as to whether they were asking the right questions to really solve our pandemic. It seemed like they were asking questions like, how do we get a vaccine quickly? How do we make expensive new medic medicines? And what's the best way to isolate people? But in our functional medicine model, we got to ask questions like, what could help the immune system work better? and more effectively. So we found things like, oh yeah, nutrients from the immune system, so let's optimize nutrients. And what could be taxing the immune system? So we found things like, 
inflammation and reverse that and environmental toxins, so things like mycotoxins and heavy metals and blood sugar fluctuations. We can look at lifestyle factors like meditation even changes the way our genes express. But I have to admit, I had many dark days, like the dark night of the soul, with the way that COVID unfolded, the missed opportunities, the unnecessary deaths, and the economic and loneliness that people were suffering from unnecessarily. And I believe that COVID just really revealed the tip of the iceberg about the trajectory, tra um, trajectory of human health. We are in deep yogurt. When you look at the th people who are most susceptible in the World Health Organization numbers, the heart disease deaths are almost 18 million a year. The cancer is 10 million, diabetes 1.6, and now there's over 422 million people diagnosed with diabetes. We've lost 3.46 million from COVID as of yesterday. So every day I get to care for people with chronic diseases and often reverse them, as many of you do as well. But we're spending $3.3 trillion in the United States alone, and most of 90% of that is for chronic illness, which could have often been prevented. I believe often it's the association of these chronic diseases with environmental toxins. And that's probably the most pressing thing facing humanity today. So in some of my dark moments, I look for the people that inspire me the most. One of them is my dad. And he inspired me and my sisters to be the best that we could be every day. And that instilled confidence in us, in each other, and ourselves and shape the lens of how we look at opportunities and problems. My dear friend, Bo Easton, which some of you may know, um, his dad woke him up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the football and told him he was the best. And so even when he didn't make his college football team, he still believed in himself and he became a number one draft choice for the NFL. He wrote a one-man play on Broadway that was highly acclaimed and he wrote the bestseller there's no plan B for your A game. And Jeff Bland, I think many of us think of him as one of our most important heroes for the lives that we live. When I switched from chemical engineering to medicine, I knew I wanted to do medicine differently, but I didn't know how I was gonna do it. And when I saw him speak for the first time 17 years ago, I knew I had found my answer about how I could really help my patients. I have so much gratitude for how this year's unfolded with treating patients, family and friends for COVID. But we have another epidemic that we are facing and that's toxic mold. And it has implications for this pandemic. Mycotoxins often suppress the immune system. So it's critical to be addressing these in our patients. One example is mycophenolic acid. It's one of the toxins made by penicillium, and it's one of the toxins that we can measure in our patients and in the environment. It inhibits lymphocyte proliferation, antibody production, cellular adhesion, and the migration of T cells and B cells. And it's used in an immunosuppressant for transplant patients. So I think we actually need a public service announcement. <laughs> Um, especially here in Central Texas after our freeze, we need to be warning people about what toxic mold can do to them and to their health. Mold makes thousands of toxins and it can affect any organ system in the body, but most alarmingly, it even affects how our genes express, how our mitochondria make energy, and the health of our cell membranes. So until we're building buildings differently, we need to be vigilant for our patients. Okay, so you all know that unfortunately, humans are making a mess of our planet by poisoning our food, our air, our water, and our buildings. However, I would say, based on my own experience with three pretty major health journeys, there's always a platinum lining. 
And I'm hoping that COVID is one of those, that it actually helps us to clean up our planet and inspire people to take better care of their bodies, to make the changes necessary to correct their current health problems and to do prevention. And I believe that you all doing this work are the medicine, that by applying functional medicine, by asking the right questions and doing your best, that we can change the trajectory of human health and the health of our planet. Thank you. All right, Anne Schiffer, thank you, Anne. Beautiful. Wonderful, agreed, 100%. All right, yeah, there's so, so much to unpack there, but uh, in, in complete agreement uh, with, with everything you said there. All right, next up, we're gonna talk about women's health. Uh, we're grateful to have uh, someone at the cutting edge of the future of women's health here. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Sean Tassoun. Leave it to a gynecologist to bring up the rear. Um, it's funny because I'm, I'm an integrative gynecologist and I know this because when my oldest son, who's 25, when he was in kindergarten, he had to fill out that form that you all get when you have kids like all about my dad or all about my mom. So he filled it out in school and he brought it home and I was looking at it and it's like, what does your dad do? And it said, he looks at vaginas. <laughs> and I was like, great. <laughs> this was before the internet. Um, so, so luckily she knew what I did for a living. But, um, but yeah, so I have a story about a woman, oddly enough, named Karen, even in this time, her name is Karen. And, um, she had ovarian cancer at 51, and I would talk to this woman a lot, and she would call me on the day that she would get her chemo. She had stage three ovarian cancer, and I'm a gynecology resident, so I'm spending a lot of time with her. And she, I, I could talk to her about the disease, I could talk to her about the chemo, but what bothered her the most was just the discomfort and how it was interfering with her life and how nobody would give her hormones because of the ovarian cancer. And she lived for five years and was just a miserable wreck. And then I was with her the day that she passed away because it was my mom. And um, I felt really bad that I couldn't help my own mom. You know, I'm, I'm a doctor. I, I do robotic surgery now. And, um, but I didn't know what to do for my mom. And so, as you do when you are soul searching, you go to Sedona. And um, <laughs> that's where I went. I don't know what those vortexes are, but that's where I went. And I read this crazy book called Eight Weeks to Optimum Health by Andy Weil. And he was talking about fish oil and CoQ10, and it blew my mind. And so I then went and did a PhD in philosophy because I like to spend a lot of money and <laughs> toured South America and did lots of things that are similar to ketamine <laughs> and got buried in the desert in Guatemala overnight and really kind of found myself and found a relationship with my mom and, and what I've tried to do in my practice, I still take insurance, um, is to try, and in order to do that, I can't, I didn't understand a word Ann Shippey said, by the way. She's too smart for me. Um, but I have friends like Ann Shippey who, as a gynecologist, if I suspect somebody has mold, I have friends, I have Ann, I have other doctors in town that, um, and providers in town like Emily, that if I have a patient who's younger, I can send them to her. And for me, functional means family. And I'm, I'm often just, I'm an only child, so I'm kind of, this is all new to me to be a part of a community. But I want people in my community to also feel as a functional provider that I'm not judging. If, if, if you need my help, I'm here for you. I have a very similar background, but I need you too. And I think that's what we need to figure out in this community is how to, 
how to not feel threatened by competition, that as JJ says, JJ Virgin, rising tide lifts all boats, and we're all in this together. And I'm really dedicated to women's health because I couldn't help my own mother, but I think that now I can help other women because I've learned things, not with ketamine, but I did learn things. And I just wanted everybody in the room to know that just from my, my heart, that if you need any help with any of female patients, or if you need help yourself, um, my superpower, and I think all of us in this room probably have some of this, is listening. Um, I get paid to listen. And most of the time, it's the complaints about husbands, but um, <laughs> I, I could write a book on that. Um, but it's just listening to your patient. Narrative medicine is what, is, is what we do. It's, it's not just the hot flashes. It's not just the decreased libido. It's the story behind that. And I'm trying to meet you, and I'm trying to meet patients. And I've been in Austin for eight years. So I'm more than happy to, to help when I can. And I think my, my thing here is, is that I just want to meet as many people as I can. I'm an introvert, so it's hard. But I want to meet as many people as I can, and I want to be there for you. And I think as functional providers, that's what we can do for each other. Thanks. All right, thank you, Sean. You know, so much to unpack in that in that conversation. You know, women have created the functional medicine revolution one way or another. 75% of patients are women, 75% of practitioners are women in this space. There's just an intuition that something is dead ass wrong with the way that we're practicing chronic disease care. And women just know to speak up and get on with doing it right. So we're super grateful to, you know, to everyone in the communities doing that. So on that talk, we have so many uh, great specialties here in, uh, in Austin, and I'm super excited to have someone on the cutting edge of genetics, and I know she's gonna be talking about it today, but just this week, exciting data making its way out about reversing Alzheimer's, autism, other brain disease. Please welcome Dr. Sharon Hausman-Cohen. <laughs> So I'm really excited to be here and talking to you about genomics and how it can be used to really help untangle some of those mysteries that all of our speakers have talked about and personalize medicine. As James said, thank you for the introduction, genomics has come to the time where we can use it as a clinical decision support tool. We can use it to make better understanding, have better understanding of what's going on for people and use it to reverse chronic disease. We're really excited that our first two studies are coming out, the one with Dr. Bredesen and another one with autism is um, coming out real soon. But before I tell you about the work in these studies, I want to tell you, uh, just as a refresher for so everyone's on the same page, the difference between genomics and genetics. So genomics refers to the very tiny changes in your DNA that are not pathogenic, they're not disease-causing in and of themselves. But when you have these little genomic changes, these one-letter changes, in combination with environmental exposures, things like mold, you have them in combination with poor nutrition or lack of certain nutrients, or in combination with each other, they can be very important in disease etiology. And when you can understand genomics and what's going on and understand the root cause, you can then modify it. Now, the advantage to genomics over some of the other tests that we've been using in functional and integrative medicine is we're not limited by what's going on in the blood or the urine. Most of the tests we do reflect metabolites and things in the blood and the urine. But because of the blood-brain barrier and the blood-gut barrier, because of how inflammation works in the lungs and throughout the body, and how bone turnover works and all those other systems, if you're just measuring blood and urine, you can't tell that in an autistic child, TNF-alpha levels may be 50 times higher in their brain, or that in someone with mold, they have a problem with their transporters that are basically the bouncers that kick the mold out of the brain. 
Now, every good thing has its you know, ups and downs. What's the downside of genomics? Well, we're taught in medical school and in all of our different trainings, don't order a test unless you know what to do with it. That was the problem that I and my IntelliX DNA team set out to solve. Because there's lots of genomics tools, patients are always bringing us their 23 and me going, hey, can you use this to fix my cognition or to fix my you know, family history of heart disease? And there was no tool out there that said, what are, which gene SNPs actually have evidence for having clinical function and outcomes? So that was one important thing. But then once you have a gene, what do you do about it? So genomics has come to the point where we can now use it for clinical decision making, and that's using clinical decision support tools. As the medical director of IntelliX DNA and heading their research team, I've had the privilege of working with hundreds of clinicians across the country and seeing some amazing success stories. And I want to give you a little insight by telling you two very brief case studies. So the first one is a, sto a story of a patient who is a professor here in Austin that came to Resilient Health here in Austin, not my patient, but uh, is where I work. And he came in and he said, I know something's wrong. I'm having trouble balancing my checkbook. I'm having trouble with math. And I'm a physics professor. So that's kind of a no-brainer, not no pun intended, that there's a problem going on. And he was having problems at the grocery store. We did a slums, found out that he had a score of 19, which is dementia. Dementia is less than 21. We also did his genomics. He was not an ApoE4, so that was good, none of the Alzheimer's gene. But then you have to uncover what is going on. Well, it turns out he had two copies of a gene that's in the mitochondrial membrane that lets in all the mitochondrial nutrients, alpha lipoic acid and CoQ10, and that's only in 4% of the population, but can increase the risk of Alzheimer's 4 to 12 times. He also had major problems in his detox pathways. So we did some relatively simple fixes. We gave him things like Mitocor and CoQ10 and other mitochondrial supplements, pushed his detox pathways with various forms of glutathione and sulforaphane, adjusted some nutrition and some other nutrients. Four months later, his score, his slums, was 26. Now let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Dr. Gutierrez talked about autism, and she actually has been doing some of this work with us. A child with autism. This case comes from Australia of a young man who was born with severe autism, nonverbal at birth, worked with an excellent autism practitioner. By age 14, 15, he was having three-word three rudimentary language. Then she got his genomics. He had a number of things that were very unusual and easily modified, including a gene that had to do with glutamate scaffolding, the scaffolding of the brain. She gave him, again, from the tool, we can give ideas as to what is evidence support, high-dose zinc, melatonin, blue light filtering glasses, oxytocin, modified this gene, a number of other inflammatory pathways and nutritional pathways that he had. And a year later, a little over a year, when he was 16, he studied for and passed his driver's license test. Yeah. His IQ, thank you, his IQ, went up 20 points, which was enough for him to be mainstreamed. He was able to have his language understood by classmates and teachers, and he got a job in the cafe after school and went to prom. So really exciting work. Now, not every patient that you order genomics on are you going to get these kind of amazing, life-changing events. But what you can use genomics for is to help kind of hone in on what is the root cause, whether you're dealing with women's health, like osteoporosis and hormone issues, or cognition, or autism, or detox pathways, or heart disease, or, or so many other things. And the advantage to using genomics is twofold. One, the patient knows that the plan you're coming up with is specific to them. The other really great advantage is when you see patients getting well and you feel like you have something to guide you because as far as we have come, there's still a lot of trial and error medicine, you get more clinician satisfaction. So I encourage you, if you're thinking, or if you tried genomics in the past and weren't sure that you really got anywhere for it, look at genomics as a clinical decision support tool. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sharon. All right. So I want to take a moment just to talk about something that is really important, and is that 
you know, I'm sure you've gone to events and there are sponsors and it's interesting to have sponsors and, and, and ultimately what we wanted to do at the Functional Forum was to do things really differently. Like we know that if you want to create a complete transformation of healthcare, you are going to need allies. You're going to need allies that are going to do things that no one else can do. And I want to talk about the elephant in the room when it comes to all medicine, right? Talk about conventional medicine and functional medicine and particularly functional medicine. We have a huge problem. And that problem is adherence. Adherence to the protocol. Who executes the protocol? Do they take their drugs? That's one thing in conventional medicine, and there's a whole industry built around it. But when you're getting people not just to take a few different drugs, but actually getting people to change their diet and lifestyle, it now becomes the central part of the whole business. It doesn't matter what testing you've done, they've got to do it. And so I'm super excited, right? Our first, one of our first sponsors at the Functional Forum who we've aligned with for seven years now is Fullscript. And I'm super excited to share some really, really innovative things that are coming because they want to flip the script on treatment adherence. This is treatment adherence in integrated medicine, the first complete literature review and industry insight. This is going to be coming out next week. This is a big deal because this is the first time we've been talking about what might be the difference maker in the transformation of healthcare. Look at these numbers, 100 to 290 billion, the estimated cost of non-adherence in the US healthcare system. 30 to 69% estimated rate of hospital readmissions due to medical non-adherence, right? 60% of US adults with one chronic disease, we know that. Adherence is everything. And I have to say, again, now that we've been running group visits for people, I know there are a lot of people that go into functional medicine doctor's offices, get unbelievable treatment programs, and then never do it, and feel ashamed, and don't come back, and you don't know why they didn't come back, and it's not really your fault, but it kind of is, right? And so we're going to talk about that uh, right now. So full script is doubling down on adherence. If you don't have a full script account, you're going to want one after this for a few reasons. One, the leading med medical research I spoke about. Fullscript is an adherence technology. Once you prescribe the supplements on Fullscript, the technology works to get them to order it again and again and again, and, uh, and to, to facilitate and make it easy to order. But this is a new thing that they're developing. And if you open an account soon, you tell them that you came from us, they're going to put you in the first batch of people which they're trying a new program called Treatment Plus. And Treatment Plus, if you make a prescription to a patient and they don't fill it, Full script will call them and find out why and get them on the phone and connect with them and get them moving. And they've seen in their trials so far a 20% increase in adherence by actually taking that extra step to fulfill. So I think, you know, full script went from something that was kind of nice to have to absolutely necessary during the pandemic because I worked in a clinic 15 years ago where we had all the supplements and we're trying to ship them out the whole time. It's an absolute nightmare. This is a game changer for the industry, and I would recommend that everyone, if you have a chance to read this treatment adherence and integrated medicine report, they have more data about adherence than anyone in the industry because they have thousands of practitioners writing protocols and they can see who adheres and who doesn't. And they found a number of things that are consistent with what drives adherence. So we're gonna be sending everyone who registered tonight an update so you can get that protocol, you can find out about the five things. And on a week on Wednesday, we're bringing out a podcast which is launching this treatment adherence. You're gonna be hearing a lot about it in the next little while. And we're super excited to have sponsors who are on the cutting edge of making it easy to practice great functional medicine. So I want to come back to this for a moment because I want to talk a little bit more um, about this. So as I mentioned earlier, like we need a lot more of all of this. And the cool thing about, about this model that I'm sharing with you, you can own as much of this or as little of this as you want to. If you just want to do functional medicine, if you just want to be a specialty provider, you can do that. But if you want to bring in integrated therapies and group visits, the Lifestyle Matrix has the group visit toolkits. There's tons of tools. If you want to do pharmaceuticals and surgery, like a lot of the physicians do here, Sean's still doing surgery, you can do it. It's choose your own adventure, right? There's a lot that we can all be doing here. But one of the things that we're going to have to face is that the reason why these things are important, why we have to have these bottom layers sorted out, is because this is what contributes to health or disease, right? 20% of health is created 
by medical care. 30% is healthy behaviors, right? We've got to facilitate behavior change. 40% is socioeconomic factors. And ultimately, we need to be able to work with those kind of things for everyone. And this is, again, these are actually bits from the book. You can see that loneliness, high social stress, is a bigger driver of all-cause mortality than physical inactivity, alcohol, and smoking. And just think about how many dollars have been spent on that. And ultimately, what we've come to see over time, what I put in the book, is that chronic disease is biopsychosocial in nature. And you cannot solve a biopsychosocial disease with a purely biological input, right? We need to deliver biopsychosocial inputs. And that's why we're gonna talk a little bit more about community and uh, education. So we've, everyone so far, we've had a pharmacist, we've had mainly doctors. I wanted to make sure that we had a chiropractor speak um, as, as part of this. Um, uh, a few months ago, I was hanging out with Dr. Carla Mellenbacher, and we had an unbelievably interesting conversation about gargling and the vagus nerve. So please welcome to the stage, Dr. Carla Mellenbacher. My dream team. Hello. I also was like Anne and prepared with and today, so I might be looking at my paper also. Did this just go away? Can you hear me? Okay, cool. All right, so James asked me to talk about polyvagal theory and community, which no pressure, right? So I am gonna go a little bit into the science and then sum it up with what the point of all this is. So classically, the polyvagal system or the autonomic nervous system has been described as the sympathetic fight or flight system and the parasympathetic rest digest system. And that our body is constantly balancing between the two to maintain homeostasis. Well, polyvagal theory has added a third, more sophisticated layer to the conversation. The fundamentals of the nervous system first, before I go into it, is the only reason we have a nervous system is because we are moving creatures, right? So we are very chemically similar to plants and trees. The reason that they do not have nervous systems is because they don't need to move. So everything our nervous system does is it takes in sensory information, it processes that sensory information, and it has a appropriate motor output to that information. So the foundation of the nervous system is reflexes, then gross motor control, then fine motor control, and then complex thought and emotion. So if you ever hold, held, held an infant, you can see this very easily, the way that children develop is slowly developing more motor control to feel safe in their environment. A great example of this, if you've ever held a baby, is the grasping reflex. So they will grab onto your finger and not let go for dear life, right? This is because they literally need mom and dad to hold them up to stand upright from gravity. As soon as they can hold themselves upright from gravity with reflexes, they can then drop this reflex and move on to the next layer of motor control, which is fine motor skills. So let's talk about the polyvagal system now, which is really the science of safety. So the first level of safety is our social engagement system. This is our ventral motor nucleus of the vagus nerve. This is above the diaphragm, our myelinated control. So I can see my environment, I can read facial expressions and tone, I can hear auditory and vestibular movement. The great example of this is dogs, right? So you see them introduce each other and they'll sniff each other, they'll look around, and they're checking each other out to make sure you're safe. But humans do this in microseconds because of our programming. So the second layer of defense, let's say that the social engagement didn't work out. Now we're in our sympathetic fight or flight. Oxygen will go to the tissues, I will increase my heart rate, increase my breath, and I am ready to mobilize out of the situation. Let's say that the mobilization doesn't work out. Now the third layer and the most primitive layer of our safety system is our dorsal motor nucleus, which is everything below the diaphragm, which is all unmyelinated. The great physiological example of this is like if you're held gunpoint, you will literally lose your bowels, right? Just shut right off. We call this the freeze response. The, um, we completely will actually disassociate. So, Let's use the example of ADHD. A lot of you guys have brought up autism and ADHD. So oftentimes with these kids, they will have sensory processing issues with their inner ear and vestibular system. So 
if they cannot tune out these low frequency predatorial sounds, they will not be able to tune into a high frequency human voice and feel safe. So if they don't integrate these reflexes from gravity, they're not gonna be able to feel safe enough to listen to their teacher in front of them. So my challenge now is for you guys as functional medicine practitioners to look at this beyond just the microbiome, right? Because the real reality is that the pathways of the social engagement system or the pathways of social behavior are the same as the pathways that help us heal and restore. So they are not just correlative systems, they are the same system from different perspectives. A lot of functional medicine practitioners will say the gut and microbiome are the root of all disease. Well, my challenge is to dig a little deeper and to ask yourself what started that disbalance in the microbiome and that disbalance in the gut. I do want to end on a quote. I'm sure I'm not quite to my five minutes, but one of my favorite quotes from Louis Casolino. See, I didn't prepare much either, like Ant. <laughs> Neuroscientists have already possessed the perfect model for understanding interdependency, the individual neuron. We know that neither the individual neuron nor the single human being exists in nature. Without mutually stimulating interactions, people and neurons wither and die. In neurons, this process is called apoptosis, while in humans, it's called depression. I'm sure many of you have heard the longest study ever done on humans out of Harvard, where they followed hundreds of Harvard students over 80 years. And as James pointed out, it was not diet, lifestyle, or wealth that they found was the answer to the highest success in health systems. It was relationships. So we as humans need, you know, what we've intuitively thought has been proven in neuroscience now that we physically need each other to survive. That's all I got, thank you. <laughs> all right, we need each other to survive. Another reason for the community and the Functional Forum uh, getting together and uh, yeah, super, super interesting. All right, for our final conversation here tonight, we're super excited to have my good friend all the way from San Antonio, Texas. You know, one conversation that never really comes up in functional medicine is cancer. And we're super grateful to have uh, Linda Isaacs. Dr. Linda Isaacs is in the crowd here somewhere. Um, works with, uh, there she is, um, uh, a partner of Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez for many years in New York and used to come to the Functional Forum in New York and uh, now is here in Austin. But for our final uh, presentation here tonight, um, please welcome to talk about the reinvention of cancer care, Dr. Derek Guillory. <laughs> I'm last because I have a two-hour presentation on the Krebs cycle and all of its metabolites. There'll be a quiz right after. So I have a confession to make. Hopefully you'll raise your hand with me when I confess that I am scared to death of taking care of cancer patients. Who else is scared to death of taking care of cancer patients? Uh, my grandpa, when I was a brand new doctor and new absolutely nothing about anything. My grandpa was uh, struggling with his battle against pancreatic cancer and um, he lost that battle. Um, I get emotional every time I talk about this, I can't help it, it's a true story. So he, um, he told me at the, near the end, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. And he begged out loud for God to let him die. Out loud. <laughs> and uh, before I go all negative, um, the positive in that is that that inspired me to want to take care of cancer patients. But in functional medicine training, we don't get any training about cancer. I'm like, where's the cancer training, right? N nothing, absolutely nothing about cancer. So we've been in a 50-year war started by President Nixon in 1971. And the, my question is, are we winning that war? Uh, are we even in the fight? I'm not sure. So my recipe for reinvention of cancer care is this. One shift, two causes, two connections, 
and one driver. One shift, two causes, two connections, and one driver. We have to shift from, tr from treating diagnosis codes to treating people. We have to shift from just taking care of tumors, and we have to take care of terrain. Terrain is all the factors that cause cancer, the environmental factors, the nutritional factors, the genomic genetic factors, the epigenetic factors, the hormonal, the immune factors, the emotional factors, we have to take care of all of them. We have to stop treating symptoms, and we have to start treating causes. And we have to remember that tumors are causes. T t tumors are symptoms, they're not causes. Two causes for all disease, or only two, it doesn't matter what the name of the disease is. I'm an emergency doctor, so I have to simplify things. It's all algorithms, right? If, if not this, then that. So two causes, deficiency and toxicity, that's it. This is how I explain to my patients. It helps me simplify their care plan. It helps them manage their disease. Deficiency is everything you need that you don't have. Toxicity is everything you have that you don't need. If you replace what you need and you remove what you don't, everybody can get well. Many people often do. And that's true in cancer. And cancer freaks me out. <laughs> These patients are complicated. Uh, but the paradigm rings true. So we have to treat the causes of disease. Um, the cancer patients, they're the most deficient. They're the most toxic of all my patients. Um, I could talk about that for two hours, but I won't. So we'll move to one of the most um, apparent toxins in the last year, which is loneliness. Um, toxic loneliness. These, pe these patients are alone. They're totally alone. And they need to be connected with others in community. So I'm more excited about talking about community than just about any other thing because I'm trying to connect my patients in my office with other patients that are fighting the same battle, with other patients that are fighting a different battle or no battle at all because they have to be connected in community to be empowered, to reinforce all of the things we talk about, to be educated, and we have to connect in community. So I know a drop. All that I know is a drop, but all that I don't know is an ocean. But my drop is different from your drop and yours. We need you. We need you. And we have to connect all of our drops together in community because when we connect them, we can overcome the ocean of chronic disease that's already upon us. And cancer, in 1971, almost nobody got cancer when Nixon declared a war on cancer. And now, Almost half of us, almost half of us will get cancer. And I'm convinced the only reason the other half don't get cancer is because they got cardiovascular disease and died early. So, one driver. You know, I started off by saying I'm scared to death. I, I have often, if not always, been motivated by fear. I think that doctors are often motivated by fear. Um, I'm speaking personally because I'm afraid of the medical boards. I'm afraid of the family who's going to sue me. I'm afraid of the regulators who are coming to take away the tools that we use, right, naturally. But I, the only thing that takes away my fear is when I sit in a room with a patient and they feel and they know and I can feel the love for them. So love is the only thing that takes away my fear. And, and it sounds cheesy, but all we need is love. And that is true. It's the only thing that takes away my fear. Anger and vengeance and um, frustration is not going to motivate us to change. But love if we love our patients, if we love one another, if we love our colleagues that don't understand, if we love the earth and the food and the water that nourish us, then we can change medicine and we can change cancer care. So one shift, two causes, two connections, one driver, love, and we can reinvent medicine. That's it. Oh. All right. Beautiful way to, to have our last talk here, and I want to wrap up what the community 
reinvention of medicine looks like. You know, community helps reduce the friction to more doctors to find out about functional medicine, and community reduces the friction for patients to engage in healthy behaviors and make their trajectory. And just like full scripts, and just like orthomolecular, lifestyle matrix, Genova, freedom practice coaching, all the people that are gonna be supporting this new vision for this community reinvention of medicine, I wanna share a little bit about what I've been working on here for the last year in COVID at home. And Derek and I had a, we actually met in Austin. We met at the uh, 2015 IFM conference, uh, connected since then last year, I had a chance to share with him my vision for this community reinvention of medicine, specifically for making it super easy for every doctor, not just functional medicine doctors, to prescribe a functional medicine episode of group care. And that's because I see, and you, it, since the last functional forum, it's come out in the British Medical Journal that group delivered functional medicine is more effective, more effective than one-on-one -on -one and less costly. And that comes from the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. So if we want to become the standard of care, that has to be the baseline. And that's why Derek, myself, Barclay Burns, who's in the, in the house here tonight as well, we've been working for the last year on a vision called Heal Community. And this project was really from the fact that I recognize that there's two groups of people that I see that go for functional medicine right now. There's the 15% of people who are like desperate, right? Severely chronically ill, typically older, multiple chronic illnesses, right? They're just desperate. And on the other end, there's the other 15% of people who are just empowered and know better but it's this middle group of the population that are one or two chronic illnesses that are trending towards being over here. But if you catch them at the right time, you can arrest those behavior changes and you can move them into the healthy group. And whether these people become the chronically ill or whether they become the healthy, that is gonna determine whether we bankrupt this country or whether we reinvent medicine. And ultimately what we created with Heal Community is a completely virtual, prescribable episode of group functional medicine care. So that all of your colleagues, imagine if, Talk, you want to talk about that triangle earlier? There's enough functional medicine doctors in this room to be able to fill that part of the triangle. We need to grow the bottom of the triangle. We need to empower people to make behavior changes. And every doctor who takes insurance in Austin could prescribe an episode of functional medicine care through Heal Community, no supplements, no labs, just groups of people coming together to change their behaviors and get right with themselves, sitting in groups and dealing with it. And I just created this because I'm sure you've all met patients in this red line, where they get super excited about you, they come in, they start taking the protocol, and then they don't really do the lifestyle changes. They just do the protocol at the beginning and they get better. And as soon as they stop doing the lifestyle changes, it's a bit of a wonky yo-yo from there. But ultimately, if you get patients who are fired up, who understand their role in reversing chronic illness and make lifestyle changes and have a community to support them and understand why they're doing it, they can't help but get healthy. Right? And they start sleeping well, they start doing all the healthy behaviors, and if you can get them to do both at the same time, they're gonna to get to health and do it more quickly. So this is Heal Community. We're super excited to be partnering with allopathic physicians and functional medicine physicians who take insurance, where we essentially will um, do everything, all of the boring, annoying bits of running virtual online groups, hiring the coaches, training them, developing the program, um, tracking the outcomes, another thing that we do terribly in functional medicine. If every functional medicine practitioner tracked their outcomes, we would already be the standard of care. It's just that it took Cleveland Clinic to actually track these things to get into JAMA and BMJ, but now it's starting to come out. And so we'll be able to track all across clinics. We prepare billing documents, and we have built this custom technology platform. All the clinics have to do is establish care, prescribe the program, submit the billing. This is an absolute passion of mine, I feel like, is the thing that can really transform the speed of scale of functional medicine into the ecosystem by making it super easy for doctors to do it and actually help a doctor who's making money, to, sorry, who's billing insurance to make more money than prescribing uh, pharmaceuticals. And I think those three things coming together are gonna be, be really important. So that is Heal Community. If you wanna find out more about it, uh, you can go to healcommunity.com and check it out if you bill insurance. We'd love to hear from you. So just to remind you, 
this is the strategy, play whatever role in it. Um, if you want to, uh, you know, whatever uh, part of the practice you want to deliver, I think that if we all work together, we can build the new system that builds, that makes the existing system obsolete. So I want to talk to you about what this might look like if we win, right? Can, just want you to imagine and envision what a winning strategy looks like. So near where I grew up, there's a little town of 100,000 people called Froome, F-R-O-M-E. And in Froome, two doctors recognized that social relationships, whether you look at complex measures of social integration, high versus low social support, and, uh, and the overall findings were that social relationships were a bigger driver than all of these other factors. Derek spoke about it, Carla spoke about it. We've all spoken about it because it's true. So what did they do? In the five clinics in the NHS that ran, they hired a health coach in each of those clinics. They spent a year documenting every community group that existed, church groups, sports groups, men's groups, women's groups, any kind of group. They found 400 groups. They then recruited, not 700, this is an old slide, over 1,000 community connectors. 1% of the population volunteered, and all they were there to do was to connect people to that one website where people could be part of a group. And in a short period of time, this happened. While in the rest of Somerset, emergency room admissions over four years went up by about 25%, in Froome, it went down by about 20%. They saved tens of millions of pounds for the NHS by putting people in communities. This is the community reinvention of medicine. This is what it's gonna take to do. And by far, the best place to start new communities, new groups, is in healthcare because there's already budget assigned for it. Medicare will pay for the groups. Commercial insurance will pay for the groups. There, are, there is budget allocated for medical care, and therefore we can build those groups together. So you want to talk about flattening the curve of healthcare costs and leaving this country and being a worthy ancestor for our children? This is the way we do it. This is the community reinvention of medicine. The man, Julian Abel, who facilitated that, Dr. Julian Abel, is putting on a conference coming up the 17th and 18th. It's free to join. It's elevatecompassion.org. If you want to hear all about the most innovative things that are happening at the cross-section of functional medicine and, uh, and community, that's the place to go. It's really interesting, actually. Julian came from the point of being a clinician, seeing that groups worked, and then realizing, hey, if you just infuse these groups with healthy behaviors, then you know it's a really fantastic synergy. Obviously, we in functional medicine coming from the other end, which we see that functional medicine is the operating system for reversing chronic illness, and then we come back to groups to make it the only way efficient enough for everyone to do it, and we came to the same conclusion. And we've, it's been amazing to get to know him, and I highly recommend if you can check it out, uh, it's free, uh, June 17th and 18th, elevatecompassion.org. This has been the Community Reinvention of Medicine. You are such, you are the Community Reinvention of Medicine. It's not this, it's not us, it's all of us. And I'm really grateful for you coming out. I think that this is an amazing like, moment to plant the flag after COVID and show that we in this community have the solutions for what ails us. Been grateful to be here with all of you. Thank you and good night. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Community Reinvention of Medicine. Whatever role you want to play, we're super excited to support you. Please feel free to get in touch with us however we can help. And next month, we start a three-part series on the reinvention of mental health. Critical viewing. We'll see you next time.